Hey guys, welcome back to today's video. Today is Thursday, October 15th, 2020, and today I'm going to be going through the Progress Campaign's forecast. So before we get started, if you'd like to follow along on their website, you can go ahead and check it out at rprogress.org. The link will be in the description down below. Once you get there, just go ahead and click forecast and make sure you're on the presidential election forecast. And we're going to cut spokesperson right now from the rprogress.org website, who's going to talk about a little bit of their methodology. Hey, everyone, and welcome to the Progress Campaign's forecast coverage for Let's Talk Elections. First thing is at the bottom left corner of the forecast page, you can download the full methodology, which is a two page PDF going over exactly how we build up our model. It'll give you a much better insight into uh, how it's built and how our projections are made. But overall, top line numbers right now, 86.4% chance for Joe Biden to win the Electoral College, 13.6% for Donald Trump, which means Joe Biden is very likely to win the Electoral College. So a brief overview of how we created this forecast. The traditional way to forecast elections is taking an aggregate of polls in each individual state and then uh, you know, adding in different fundamental factors like demographics or economic factors or different um, fundamental variables. What we have opted to do instead is we actually look at each one of the roughly 36,000 precincts that are uh, in the country and we use two different models. One is a turnout model, meaning how many people are going to show up and how those people um, are broken down by demographics. So how many 18 to 29 year olds are showing up? How many Hispanic or Latinos are showing up? We use voter registration. We use domestic migration. We use different census data to figure out exactly who's turning out. The second model is a voting intention model, meaning how these folks are voting, how 18 to 29 year olds in Wisconsin are voting, how Hispanic or Latino voters in Nevada are voting. And that's where we use polling. We use public polling. We use the underlying data and we plug it into the model, which then builds out these projections for each individual county and then each individual state. Our model currently has Joe Biden with an 86.5% um, chance of winning the presidency is because his pathway to 270 electoral votes as of today is outside the normal margin of error, meaning he will win over 270 electoral votes, even if polls were off as much as they were in uh, 2016. Now, there still are a lot of uncertainty factors going into this election, particularly we have a lot of data in polling about how many younger voters are showing up, but we don't ever really know final numbers and vote and real voting intentions until the election actually happens. In 2018, for example, it was a big surprise that a lot of a lot more younger voters showed up than what was expected, but in 2016 it was the exact opposite. So there are uncertainty variables within that uh, projection, which is the reason why uh, it is still under 90% chance of Joe Biden winning. And just for a frame of reference, if the election were held today, our model currently predicts Joe Biden will have a 94.4% chance of winning the presidential election. And as time progresses and as election day comes closer, we're going to see that number ticking up slightly. That's why if you do go down to the change over time, you will see that even though it was pretty static throughout the primary, um, once more uncertainty factors became null, right, once Sanders supporters began showing their support for Biden, once Republicans started moving over, once um, all these different uncertainty factors we didn't know who folks were going to vote for started moving in, these, un these factors um, became less important and his odds went from uh, about 70% to 86.4% where we are today. So heading back over into the actual forecast, we're going to break this down by regions and by pathways to 270. And we're hopefully going to launch a series together with Let's Talk Elections about um, each individual swing state, basically any state which is not a solid red or a solid blue on this map you're seeing right now, um, which will dive in by each county and talk about the regions within individual states and what factors are moving it. But the first region and the most um, obvious way for Joe Biden to get to 270 electoral votes is through the Midwest. That's through Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin. And here the model is basing um, this projection on three separate factors. The first one is just Democratic turnout. In 2016, we saw rural turnout among Democrats and big city turnout among Democrats plummet. As an example, in Detroit alone, more than 100,000 Democrats who showed up in 2012 stayed home in 2016. So we're seeing a big reversion on that end. 
going into this election. The second pillar are those Obama, Obama, Trump voters. Now, even though our model projects that just over 50% of those voters are going to stay with Donald Trump in this election, it does um, forecast that about 34% of those voters are going to return to Joe Biden, and that will be a major driver. Um, of the numbers that we're seeing because you're not just adding voters on one side, you're actually taking voters away from Trump and adding them into the Biden column. The third one, and it's a perfect segue into the other uh, states and regions, is a suburban swing. This is just the organic trends that we're seeing across the country where lifelong Republican white voters, primarily in the suburbs, um, are moving over to vote for the Democrats. So putting that all together right now, um, as we said before, Joe Biden has a 80% chance of winning Wisconsin, 90% chance of winning Michigan, and 77% and um, chance of winning Pennsylvania. Suburban expansion brings us into the second region that we're looking at, and this is where we uh, find some controversy with other forecasts because we do project that uh, Joe Biden will narrowly win Georgia and as of uh, about a week ago, narrowly win Texas. And that's because of this just massive surge in new voters and this swing among uh, voters in the suburbs. So if you look at Georgia, that's the big metropolitan area around Atlanta, and Texas, that's the Dallas area, the Austin, San Antonio area, and the Houston area, as well as El Paso. And another factor which is contributing to these is that you saw those rural Democrats staying home in 2016 actually showing up. And obviously, unlike Georgia and Texas, which are very close, that suburban expansion and population growth is, is moving Arizona solid. We're going to dive into these other states later on, so definitely look forward to that. But as a brief overview, the states of Florida, North Carolina, Ohio, and Iowa are just very complicated states to project because it's not just one simple factor which will determine who wins that election. You have to have higher rural Democratic turnout. You have to have high African-American turnout and Hispanic and Latino turnout. You have to revert back a lot of those Obama, Obama, Trump voters. You have to keep and turn out folks uh, in big cities, particularly younger folks. And of course, in Florida, it's just about Democrats turning out their base of voters in that state. And then there are obviously a bunch of states which we consider not to be safe simply because they're within the margin where if something drastic happened on election day, for example, if the same factors which gave Donald Trump the presidency in 2016 would have worked against him equally in this election, that in that scenario, states like South Carolina, Mississippi, Missouri, Montana, and Alaska would become extremely competitive states and would likely even be tipping um, towards Joe Biden in that scenario. Now, that's a less than 1% chance of happening, but nonetheless, um, up until a week before Election Day, these states are going to be characterized as likely instead of it's safe. So thanks for tuning in for the brief overview of the Progress Campaign's forecast, and we hope you'll join us in the state-by-state -state series we're going to be launching starting next week. So I'm sure what you've taken from that video is a number of things about the methodology, and we're going to go ahead and look through this pretty briefly. Let's go ahead and get started. So if you want to find the full methodology, it is on the bottom of the page. You just click download methodology. You can go ahead and get it there, go through it. It's a little bit more in depth than what the video uh, presented, but essentially um, two models, turnout model and a voter intention model. Essentially what they do is take the amount of voters they expect to turn out in each individual precinct and then apply it to how they expect them to vote and this is where the model comes from so uh, joe biden as they told you was uh is outside the margin of error in terms of a chance of winning the presidency i mean he has an 88 percent chance at victory and the reason why day after day we start to see his uh, election odds narrow not narrow up expand is because if the election is held today um joe biden has a 94 percent chance at victory and as we get closer to election day the reason why Joe Biden has an 87.8% chance of victory right now is because they are somehow accounting for uncertainty. They're accounting for an event that could possibly impact the outcome of the election that could change the way the betting odds stand today. But as we get closer to election day, we're 19 days away. Every single day, we will like it see it tick up to that 94% mark. If nothing fundamentally changes about the race, it's getting very late for an October surprise from the Trump campaign against Joe Biden, considering that 17 million voters have already voted as of noon today. That's 12% of 2016's voting numbers. Um, but pretty much, you know, looking at these numbers, even if we were talking about a 2016 polling error, this was mentioned as well, uh, the Democratic Party wins the White House. And the reasons why 
um, Hillary Clinton lost in 2016, as they also presented, were due to a couple of reasons. There was decreased turnout amongst rural Democrats and urban Democrats, which ultimately ended up with a defeat in some of these battleground states. Specifically, they mentioned Detroit, Michigan, which had 100,000 less Democratic voters uh, in 2016 than in 2012. And I think that is just very significant, given that Donald Trump won that state by roughly 10 percent of that number. On top of that, there were a number of Obama, Obama, Trump voters. 34 percent of them are expected to swing back to Joe Biden. So they also mentioned mentioned not only are they calculating votes that joe biden will be earning on top of hillary clinton but donald trump will be losing support uh, and then also the suburban swing which is um you know hillary clinton actually did do better with suburban voters in certain regions of the country not so much that she did better actually more so that donald trump lost them specifically georgia texas and arizona but now we see a return nationwide in favor of joe biden so um the difference, the fundamental difference about this forecast is that they actually have Georgia and Texas as Democratic states. Now, 538 recently moved over Georgia, but they've had Georgia in the Biden column for quite some time. And up until today, um, Ohio had been a Biden state on 538, but now it's in Trump's column and so is Iowa. So Texas is the only significant difference from the 538 forecast and, you know, from a number of other forecasts. Uh, but Joe Biden, according to the Our Progress model, is the current favorite to uh, win in the battleground state of Texas. So uh, overall, I mean, it's expected to be very close. We're talking thousands of votes about out of 8 million. But all in all, I mean, this is the first time that Biden has actually led. Um, and it is pretty significant, to say the least. So let's go ahead and get back to the presidential model, um, the national forecast. And then we'll talk about it very briefly. So looking at Pennsylvania, looking at Michigan, looking at Wisconsin, these numbers are not good for Donald Trump. In fact, they reflect roughly what we see. On 538. Now, Pennsylvania is a little bit narrower um, for Joe Biden than what 538 projects, but also, I mean, this model is pretty respected. And when we're looking at a number of these battleground states, their methodology is laid out, so you can choose as to whether or not you trust it. But Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, according to the Our Progress model, Biden states. In Nebraska, second district, Biden district. In Arizona and Nevada, Biden state. So Arizona is actually a flip from 2016. It went to Donald Trump by 4% going to Biden by 3%, according to this model. In Maine, 2nd District, Biden is actually the favorite, which I think is pretty interesting. I normally characterize Maine 2nd as a Trump district, but again, I don't typically argue with numbers. And in Virginia, of course, you know, Biden running it up. Colorado, Biden running it up. New Mexico, Biden running it up. And then also, if you've noticed, there's a number of likely Republican states. Now, they aren't necessarily likely. It's just more so that uh, they're closer than expected. South Carolina, uh, Donald Trump actually has a 77% chance of victory. So South Carolina has a realistic shot of going blue. Mississippi really doesn't. Missouri doesn't. Kansas doesn't. Montana doesn't. Um, and Alaska doesn't. Just these states are closer than they traditionally are expected to be, um, and they're not safe, meaning that the margin is likely less than 15% in some of these key battlegrounds, uh, not key battleground states, in some of these more traditional and normal Republican states. So all in all, the forecast ends with Joe Biden winning 389 electoral votes to Donald Trump's 149, uh, with Joe Biden winning 52% of the popular vote, Donald Trump winning 45% of the popular vote, a difference of 11 million votes, topping uh, 2008 Obama numbers and uh, 4.6 million votes for third party candidates, uh, with 3.3% of the vote expecting to go to them, uh, a 7.49% win for Joe Biden percent wise. And as you can see, um, you know, day after day after day, Joe Biden's numbers are improving because there's a lot less uncertainty and we are 19 days away and nothing has fundamentally changed about this race. So I want to thank the rprogress.org uh, website for just providing us with this uh, forecast on top of submitting a video to be published on this channel. Again, if you want to check it out, it's at rprogress.org slash forecast. Go ahead and check it out. Link in the description down below. And I want to thank you guys so much for watching this video. Make sure to comment down suggestions below. Subscribe on the left if you haven't already and check out the Instagram and Twitter. At the bottom left of the screen, there's also a Discord link for you to go ahead and join. On the screen, there's a video you can watch and then a playlist for my 2020 election predictions. Again, thank you guys so, so much for watching and I will see you all tomorrow.